From the Lean Enterprise Institute in Boston, this is the WLEI Podcast, where we share stories of people making the world better through lean thinking and practice. For more information about LEI, including how we can help you apply lean thinking, please visit lean.org. Welcome to the WLEI Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Savas, and today I'm speaking with Robert Martin. Robert is an influential software developer. He's worked in the industry for over 50 years, and he's the author of 14 books, including Clean Code, a handbook of agile software craftsmanship, a seminal book in the industry, and he's one of the original signers of the Agile Manifesto. Over the course of the conversation, we discuss a number of subjects, including uh, software craftsmanship, what it is, and the issues it aims to address. And we also talk about the challenge of mentoring the flood of new programmers entering the industry and uh, more fundamental concepts like balancing speed and quality. And of course, we discuss AI and what the future of software could look like. Note that this conversation is part of LEI's Design Brief series, which is our weekly newsletter devoted to improving organizations' innovation capability. And this latest series is on the subject of craftsmanship. To subscribe, check out the link in the show notes. And with that, let's start the conversation. Hi, Bob. Welcome to the WLEI podcast. Thanks so much for joining me here. My pleasure. Uh, you know, we, we always kick things off with just brief introductions. LEI almost never talks about software. You're a software guy. Turns out sort of an influential software guy. I was a little embarrassed when we first spoke. I had no idea I was talking to somebody who's had such an impact on the industry, but let's start there. Uh, if you could offer uh, an introduction to yourself for our audience. My name is Bob Martin. I've uh, been a software developer for uh, 54 years, something like that. It's been a very, very long career so far. Uh, I'm the author of many books and papers, and and I give lots of talks at conferences and things like that. And I do a lot of podcasts as well, similar to this one. Um, so yeah, I've I've been around the software industry a very good long time. Uh, I was also one of the uh, original signers of the Agile Manifesto, which which drove the, the software industry towards the lean camp uh, about twenty years ago. Yeah. So. Um... I guess we can talk about the connection to lean in a little bit, but uh, LEI, we always try to frame things up in terms of uh, problems to solve. Uh, a lot of people approach lean tools as just uh, tools. You know, there's the toolbox, go ahead, start whacking away without any sort of understanding of uh, you know, what, what problem are you trying to solve with those tools. And so I thought we could just kind of start there. You know, what 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 do you see as sort of the biggest problems facing the software industry industry today? Probably the biggest problem facing the software industry is a demographic problem. Um, our industry grows at an enormous rate. Uh, the the number of programmers in the world doubles about once every five years. At least that has been the case up to now. And I, I don't see any reason for that to stop. We're kind of in a, uh, a brief uh, economic slowdown at the moment. So all the programmers out there listening might go, well, I'm having a tough fi time finding a job. But if you average out over the decades, you get this factor of five every, every decade kind of growth. And what that means is to us is that it's impossible to hire enough experienced people. The, uh, the, the newbies out, out, um, out, outweigh the oldsters by three or five or six to one. And that makes it very hard to communicate the lessons learned. And it makes it very difficult to, to have enough, enough experienced people to teach the new people coming in. So there's a, uh, a, this principle of perpetual inexperience within our uh, industry. Well, how, how does that manifest? What are the what are the consequences of that? Well, the the biggest manifestation is having to repeat the same errors over and over and over again without without learning the lessons, right? And and those of us who have paid the price and made the mistakes too many times uh, have tried to exert our influence by writing books and giving talks and and doing many other things like that but it's a um 
uh, it's kind of like swimming upstream. It's it's a difficult task because the, the flood of people coming in is so large that the message going back the other direction gets gets overwhelmed. And so we wind up in the same positions, making the same mistakes uh, over and over and over again. So you you developed this idea of software craftsmanship, and, and that's why we reached out to you originally. LEI is putting together a series on this idea of craftsmanship, principally in hardware, where the idea of craftsmanship has been around for a very long time. But in software, that was I'd never heard of it before until uh, a gentleman we're, we're friendly with in the industry, he had just told us he had come from a software craftsmanship conference. I thought, well, what, what is that? That doesn't even make sense. What is software craftsmanship? And uh, I asked, where could we learn more about this? And your name came up. Turns out you've you've written a whole book on software craftsmanship. You've led sort of a movement around software craftsmanship. And, you know, part of my primitive understanding. <laughs> but um, it's it sounds like craftsmanship in software could be a method to try to address those problems. When you have new people coming on, acquiring know-how is a big challenge. And if you can develop a, I'm going to use a, sort of lean term here, but standardized method of doing something, it becomes easier to transfer knowledge or the best way of doing something. Um, is that an accurate understanding? Or I guess, you know, what could you share? What what exactly is software craftsmanship and how does it address the problem that you've just described, if it does at all? If I boiled down the concept of software craftsmanship to one sound bite, it would be pride of workmanship. Uh, a a programmer going home at night, looking himself in the mirror or herself in the mirror and saying, you know, I did a good job today. Uh, that's not a very common experience. Uh, most programmers uh, have the kind of opposite experience, which is I had to do a terrible job today because of the external pressures, because of everything going on. Because of, of whatever the environment is, I was forced to do less than my best today. And the idea of software craftsmanship is the opposite of that. Wouldn't it be nice if we could say, hey, today I did a very good job. I could be proud of the work I did. This is uh, manifested through a set of principles, most of which are, you know, do a good job. Uh, one of the principles, for example, is the Boy Scout rule, uh, which is, Always, we have this this term in software called checking in. We check in the work we did today into the base of code that, that is growing. Always check your code in cleaner than you checked it out. So when you check it out to work on it, you put it back in and it's better. Always make it better every day. That's one of the principles. We're also, uh, we also foster a set of disciplines. Um, which are similar to the idea of standard procedures, but but they're not exactly procedures in this case. They are disciplines of behavior. Uh, so one of those disciplines is the uh, the simple idea of of continuously cleaning your code, always making it better, always improving it. Another one is the idea of always testing your code, always writing complementary code that tests the existing code, uh, similar to the way accountants do double entry bookkeeping, right? To write two sets of code that are complementary to each other, one of which tests the other. And you wind up with a much more reliable uh, behavior that way. The idea of, um, you said most software engineers, they, they leave the workplace feeling like they've done a bad job because of the environment that they're in, that compels them to do a bad job. Um, what What is that? What What are those factors and why do they exist? I mean, technology is a, is a rapidly evolving industry. Uh, you know, there's, there's this idea of, you know, you need to go fast. Uh, is it that? Is, the, is it the pressure to go fast and not slow down to do it? What is it that's causing that, oh, that it, sort it, of reaction? It's certainly the pressure to go fast. And, and that pressure, it's a very interesting concept. That pressure feels external. It feels like the, the industry, the company, the management, they're making me go fast. They, they won't let me do the things that are necessary. And yet that's not true. 
if you ask the businesses and you ask the managers about this, I say, well, yeah, of course we want everyone to do a good job. There is this, um, this feeling that if I don't go very fast, I must not be a good programmer. And therefore, I must go very fast. And therefore, they are making me go very fast in order to be a good programmer. There's this uh, very interesting incorrect rationale that gets applied. And I, I don't know exactly where it comes from. I, I think it is is the idea of self-worth. You know, as a young programmer, I experienced that myself. Right? As And that was 50 years ago. <laughs> You know, but I I understood that uh, people were counting on me to make deadlines. People were counting on me to meet my estimates. I would always give optimistic estimates because that's what they really wanted to hear. And I, it took me a very long time to learn that that uh, estimating is something that you do pessimistically, and estimating is is something that is never a promise. And estimating is something that you can continuously revise and refine as you learn more. Uh, probably I spent a decade and a half learning that lesson. <laughs> so, so this is something that you think just lives inside of the typical engineer's mind that the a good engineer is a fast engineer. Uh, I I think so. Yeah, I think I think it's part of the training. It's part of the mindset. It's if you uh, watch the videos on YouTube or you you uh, see the um, the other programs that teach programmers, they concentrate on speed. Yeah. Speed seems to be really important. And and by the way, I mean speed is important. But business runs on speed. There's no doubt about that. Business runs on estimates. So the pressure is not entirely internal, but the 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 need for speed in business cannot translate directly to the programmers. The programmers can't evaluate their self-worth based on, on that driving for speed. Right. So, because so, there's also the, the, the other uh, driver, which is you also have to do a good job. You also have to produce software that works properly, that satisfies the requirements. So there's this balance that needs to be struck, and the balance always seems to shift over to the the speed side, and I think that's much more internal than it is external. Well, how do where does quality where does quality live in the spectrum between going yeah. you know going fast and doing something well? I guess how important is it, and and how do teams manage quality? Is quality managed? I'm, <laughs> and I guess that's my answer. Um, it's a it's a wonderful question. <laughs> um, uh, there was a movie long, long ago. Marlon Brando starred as uh, uh, Mister Christian on Mutiny in the Bounty, and and at the very end, the judges of William Bly, the captain of of the ship, said to him, "You know, we strive to uh, promote captains who are, come from the ranks of gentlemen, because if." Justice be not aboard in the heart of the master, it be not aboard at all. That's similar to the idea of quality here. Quality is is something that is internal to the programmer, internal to the organization. Everybody has to understand uh, that we are after a good product. It has to be done quickly, of course, but it also has to be a good product. And that emphasis is not well communicated and it's not it is not well ensconced in the typical programmer's mindset. Speed overrides quality. Now you get you get a lot of this um, in in the business mindset. Um, so, for example, a programmer might go to managers and say, "Well, you know, I could make this better if I had another two days." And the manager doesn't understand what that means. What do you mean better? It, it seems to work now. How, how, what do you have to do to it to make it? Why would it be better in the first place? There's this lack of communication. And so the uh, manager puts back pressure and says, well, I mean, would one day be enough? That that happens a lot. And, and the problem there is that the programmer has surrendered their view of quality 
to someone else. They're asking for permission to make the product good. <laughs> and and that's something you never want to do. You don't ever want to make ask for permission to make the product good. Making the product good should be the prime directive. Okay, it's got to be fast. We get that. But it also has to be good. And you should not have to go to someone else who does not understand what that quality means and ask them for the permission. So for another example, um, a programmer's programmer uh, offers an estimate, says, uh, uh, this, this task will take me a week. Manager will push back on that, of course, because they should. The manager will say, well, is there anything you can do to make that less than a week? And then the programmer offers an option. Well, if I don't write tests, then I could probably get it done in three days. That is the wrong thing to say. It is the wrong thing to offer. And the manager does not understand what those tests are about and why those tests are necessary. The manager will then say, oh, well, do that. <laughs> and you get into this very unfortunate uh, communications, miscommunication. And the miscommunication is based on a, a fundamental misunderstanding of what the programmer needs to do to make a good product and what the programmer needs to do to go fast. Well, it also sounds like there's a lack of shared understanding of what a good product is. So how do you define quality? I mean, are there quality standards that those two people can look at and say whether or not they're achieving them? Or is it also a problem that you know the gap in understanding between the engineer and the manager is just so wide, it's not always possible to achieve a shared understanding of what quality is so it's both there there are certainly aspects of programming that are too technical or or in a in a technical sphere that the manager just isn't aware of uh, and so that's a very difficult bridge to gap or get gap to bridge and and shouldn't be bridged right that should be the domain of the professionals right they know that they know what they have to do to make a good product. They should not be asking for permission to do the things that they already know they have to do. But there's also the other side of that. There are measurable aspects that managers can see, especially with a little bit of training. So, for example, um, a simple thing would be to measure um, how well tested the system is. What, what kind of testing have we put in place? How often are those tests run? What are the results of those tests? You may not understand the actual details of the test, but a good manager can look at that and say, okay, I can see that we are running tests. I can see that the discipline of testing is being followed. I can watch the test count rise and get a, a feeling that the, 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 the software team is pursuing quality properly. Uh, well, that makes sense. And you've also, I don't know, if, did you come up with the idea of test-driven development? Is that something you created, Bob? Or No, no, not at all. That was, that was I guess the, the guy who gave it a name was Kent Beck. And the guy who formalized it as a discipline is Kent Beck. Though the, uh, the roots go back very, very far. Uh, so, for example, the, um, the avionic software on the Mercury space capsule was written uh, in a in a discipline that we would today call test-driven development. For those who don't understand, including me, I'd like you to offer an explanation of this. But um, you know, for our audience, my understanding is it's similar to the concept in Lean. We use these Japanese words, which is frustrating, even though I <laughs> learned Japanese. But there's a there's a term called jidoka, and it was developed by the founder of Toyota Motor Corporation when he was still running a loom company. And the idea is that uh, you the the you separate the human from the machine, so that uh, the human doesn't need to supervise the machine and see if something is going wrong. Rather, the machine supervises itself, and so when a when a error occurs, the machine immediately stops, and that frees the operator up to do a few things. One is they can operate multiple machines at once because they don't need to worry about something going wrong and an error cascading into a huge problem, but it also frees up their mind, 
hopefully, to do problem solving. So when a defect does occur, the machine stops, they have the potential to actually begin some kind of root cause problem solving process to further enhance process capability. When you describe test-driven development, to me, it sounded similar to that because you're asking the developer to write a test to prove the code they're going to write is going to work so that what they produce is guaranteed to be successful. Is that a roughly, is that accurate understanding? Um, accurate so far as it goes, I probably wouldn't use words like guarantee, mm. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but I, perhaps a better comparison is to the accounting discipline of double entry bookkeeping. Um, double entry bookkeeping, you you take every transaction and enter it in two places. And the two places are complementary. Uh, and then there's a subtraction on the balance sheet that must be zero. And any good manager looks at the balance sheet first and sees the zero there and says, okay, I know there hasn't been a math mistake. Uh, something similar happens in test-driven development. The, the programmer will will want to write a small bit of code, but before he does or she does, the programmer will write a small test that asserts the outcome of that small bit of code. And the programmer will see it fail because that code hasn't been written yet. And then the programmer will write that little bit of code and see the test pass. And then they will proceed to the next, the next bit of code. So it goes little test, little code, little test, little code, little test, little code, around and around that loop. What that creates is, first of all, this, this um, double entry set of books that has a zero on the balance sheet. When you run the test, you see zero failures. The other thing it produces, and this is much more important, is it produces a suite of tests that you can run that provide a high degree of certainty that all the software in the system works. This gets back to your point where you've got, okay, we can separate the man from the machine now because we've got this suite of tests that we can run repeatedly over and over again. Every time anybody makes any small change for any reason, we can run that suite of tests and still know that the system works as it was specified by those tests. And that gives the programmers and everybody else, a tremendous amount of freedom. Because all of a sudden, with that suite of tests, they are free to make changes without fear that those changes will disrupt something unanticipated. You will know if those tests fail that you disrupted something unanticipated and you can correct it very quickly. One of the reasons we have difficulty in software is that programmers are afraid to make changes. They're afraid of the unintended consequences. And as a code base gets very large, the ability to predict what's going to happen when you make even a small change becomes almost impossible. So the reluctance to change things begins to overwhelm, and that allows the, the entire code base to accumulate ugliness, that's the best way I can say it, to accumulate malformed structures that appear to work but are weak and that will break down over time, will break down over, over stress or under stress from other changes. And that accumulates and accumulates. And that mess that accumulates inside the structure of the code causes estimates to grow. Everyone starts getting more and more conservative. They start expanding their estimates, saying, well, we don't know. If we add this new feature, we don't know what it's going to do. It's going to take us months now. And, and the entire project grinds to an asymptotic halt. The estimates just grow and grow without bound. This is a symptom that occurs over and over again in software projects. They start out fast. And then they gradually grind to this awful, slow, muddling uh, pace that everyone is frustrated with. If you have a suite of tests that you produce this way, you can short circuit that. You can, well, you can eliminate the fear of change. And then you can make changes that improve the structure of the system without risk of damaging the system. 
Well, not to keep tying it back to a manufacturing environment, but it is, it sounds so similar. So, you know, if you go into a production environment, typically, you know, they are in a, they're complex and they're full of expensive, you know, CapEx equipment and moving that or adjusting the flow of material information. These are very complex things, especially when you get into, you know, most systems now are hooked up to some MRP system. Doing anything to that can be enormously challenging. And, um, you know, if you go into, um, you know, I'll use the example of Toyota because they're always the best, but Toyota assembly plant, it, it sounds like those tests, it's almost like uh, Toyota standardized work. And if you're not familiar with this concept, uh, the idea is you take uh, uh, the job of a worker and you, you you write down the best way of doing it, but writing it down isn't really the point. The point of it is to capture the best way of doing something and to provide a way to test whether or not the worker can do it successfully every single time, because there's a time assigned to every element or motion that the operator is going to do in a job cycle. Say it's a minute long because they're on assembly line, they're putting, say, I don't know, a few bolts on a vehicle. Um, and if the operator gets behind in any one of those work elements, they themselves will recognize there's a problem and they have two options. They can try to fix it themselves or they can stop the assembly line, call for help, and somebody rushes over to solve the problem in time, ideally before the assembly line even stops. And so things keep moving. But it's that idea of having a way to test is this working successfully or not? And have that test happen all the time, continuously. So that um, one, you do the job that you set out to do, but also you have a way of knowing whether or not we need to fix a problem. Is there a problem that we need to solve? It sounds it sounds similar um, to, to what you're describing there. Um, but is that part of it too? I mean, is does it also enable problem solving? You know, obviously it, you know, it frees workers up to, to, to pushing things ahead, but does the testing also facilitate problem solving when things go wrong, errors happen? Oh, I sure. That's all it? the time. Um, so for example, if I make a, uh, if I make a small change to one part of the system and I see a test break in another part of the system, then I know that there's some kind of strange coupling between those two. And because I have my suite of tests, I can dig in and make a change to break that coupling without risking further damage. So the other thing that would seem to enable is operating not as a small team or a single person, but as an organization. Because if you can understand the ramifications of a change that you're working on to the larger code base. By the way, I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to software. So if I'm saying dumb things, just step in and tell me. But um, it seems like it would also enab enable a more uh, sort of enterprise-wide uh, step up in performance because you can have somebody who may not be working on you know, what, what your team has been doing, completely unfamiliar with it, understand where problems are going wrong. One of the problems that that is um, frequent in large teams or large organizations with multiple teams is that one team will have to consume the work of another, but will find problems in the other in the other team's work, unanticipated problems that the first team didn't even think about, uh, and and they'll struggle over that and they'll fight over it and you know well is this your fault no it's my fault or is it your fault. He goes back and forth with a lot of finger pointing. Eventually, it gets worked out. But if those two teams have a suite of tests that they have, they have proven that their software works using this suite of tests, then when one team consumes another, they can go to those tests and look at the tests and say, okay, these tests define how that, how that code works in there. And that's what we thought, or that's not what we thought, and we need to make these changes. So there's definitely a kind of lubrication with the with a testing organization like that. There's a lubrication in getting multiple teams to working well. So how pervasive is this way of working? Is it it sounds it sounds like it's uncommon. Uh, if I have that wrong, please correct me. But 
If it is uncommon, why why is that? Is it just because of that speed mindset? So it's um it kind of burst upon the industry twenty years ago, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. One of those reasons was that Kent Beck kind of published a book and talked about it. But another more important reason is the uh, the technology, the hardware technology, had gotten so fast and so powerful that a suite of repeated tests was practical. Prior to that, it wasn't real practical. Computers were a lot slower in those days, and they didn't have as much memory. Nowadays, we have just so much power that we can run these tests pretty fast. So that's one. That was about 20 years ago. Since that time, the the discipline has been growing in the industry. And if I I could probably wave my hands around in the air and say, well, I think by now it's reached about 20% of the programmers. Uh, 100% have heard of it, which is good, because <laughs> that wasn't true 20 years ago. But about 20% are actually practicing it to some degree. Not perfectly in most cases, but to some degree, it's, it's entered into practice. And that ratio is growing. And I, as, a, you know, as an old guy myself, I look at that and I'm pretty optimistic about it. I think, okay, if we've gotten to 20% in 20 years, then in another few decades, we'll probably have uh, increased that a great deal. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Now, you asked a different question. Why isn't it, why hasn't it grown further? And the and the answer there is we are essentially telling people to change the way they behave. People don't like to change the way they behave, especially if they learned something in school, you know, and they, they got a discipline going or a routine going and they know how to get it done and, and they don't want to be told to change the way they work. So there's that kind of inertia that we face all the time. Uh, and, you know, that's just a matter of time and effort and pressure. And we'll get that. We'll get through that. Well, you also talked about this uh, demographic problem. You said it's the biggest problem where there are just lots of new software engineers entering the space. And, um, you know, it's from what I understand, it's it's not an industry where mentorship appears to be all that strong. My understanding is it's a place where, in fact, you're almost incentivized to leave companies regularly to either search for a new opportunity or, I don't know, um, you just hear about that a lot. Um, and so what is the state of, of mentorship in software and where, where do gaps exist, do you think? Um, yeah, mentorship is a real problem. We we don't have a we don't have a culture of mentorship within saw the software industry, uh, and one of the reasons for that is is that the incoming number of people is so large that there aren't enough enough mentors. Um, one of the first books on software craftsmanship, this goes back about twenty years, uh, started to suggest the idea of an apprenticeship model. That maybe what we should be doing here is taking the uh, the people with a lot of experience and having them mentor the people who have uh, less experience, and having those people mentor the ones who have even less experience. So a, a master journeyman uh, apprenticeship kind of model um, that has that has appeared in a few places. So there's a few places who have adopted that kind of mindset. But most places have not. Most places say, well, if you've got a degree, you can just be a programmer and go ahead, join the team, and here's the code, and go to way, guys, go. And very little, um, very little structure that would communicate hard, hard learned lessons towards the young people coming in. The other side of that 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 is even I don't know if it's worse, but it's it's a, another problem, which is that the the college environment where you learn software is nothing like the work environment. They're completely different, uh, and the lessons you learn in college are not the lessons you need to have learned uh, about the way to work in business, the way to work in the industry. So there's a a big unlearning. There's a, a big um, 
uh, moment of shock as a young programmer uh, gets their first job. I'd say that's probably common across a lot of uh, industries um, when it comes to college versus the workplace. Um, I do want to go back to this the craftsmanship, and you talked about how it's all about you know pride and work. But what what does a good job look like in software? What would you say if you were looking at a a block of code or a program? What does that what does good look like? Ooh, wow. Um I could I could talk about what good code looks like. Um, but I don't think that's what you want to hear. And that's not really what what craftsmanship is about. Craftsmanship, although it should be producing good code, well structured code, nicely arranged code, it should be about the way the programmer behaves. So, um, an analogy that I like to use. You are uh, a patient uh, undergoing open heart surgery. You're having an out-of-body experience. Floating above the operating theater, you look down, you see the doctor operating on you. How do you want this doctor behaving? Do you want the doctor behaving calmly, not rushing? careful in everything that the doctor does or do you want the doctor swearing and angry and frustrated and moving jerky motions and and clearly unable to get their arms around the task ahead of them and that is craftsmanship craftsmanship is the idea of of calm competence because you have good disciplines you are well trained you are not you are not internalizing the time pressure which a surgeon with a patient on the operating table has you know that's a deadline in every sense uh, a you are not internalizing that time pressure to the point where it compromises the competence of the job but how do you if you're if you're managing the company or team or something how, what do you need to do to enable that to happen? There's a set of expectations that a good manager will set, uh, especially a manager, a manager of any organization, right? You manage by setting expectations. These are the things that I expect. I expect you guys to be able to do this and that. The expectations for a software team are fairly straightforward. I expect, you know, that, you are going to produce good work. <laughs> Fundamental expectation. I expect a good job. I expect um, that you will, when called upon, be able to prove that the work you've done works as it is supposed to work. That would go to testing, but you don't have to see testing. right? You can, you can set the expectation that the outcome should be provable. And allow everybody else to work out the fact that, oh, well, that probably means we ought to be able to test things. I expect that we will behave as a team. We will help each other. We will not isolate into little corners and put headphones on and code away without talking to anybody. We will behave as a team and, and that we'll be able to cover for each other when things go wrong. There's a whole set of these expectations that a good manager can set that will will drive a team or direct a team to adopt for themselves the principles and the disciplines of craftsmanship. The worst thing a manager can do is go in there and say, I expect you to do this discipline X. Do discipline X. Everything will be great. Set, set the expectations. The expectations are interesting because I give a talk on expectations uh, very frequently. I go out and I, I do this whole expectation talk. And one of the thing about these one of the thing, things about these expectations is they are they sound perfect to managers and customers and they sound insane to the programmers. The programmers listen to the expectations and think, "Well, that's impossible. I can't do that." And then then it's in that struggle of of uh understanding and 
converting the impossible to the possible that you get the attitude and the discipline of craftsmanship. Hmm. You can't compel people to behave a certain way. You have to create the environment for people to behave. Yes. Let them figure out how to do it. Right. But just let them know what the overall expectations are. And the expectations have to be reasonable and rational. Hmm. Right? Like the product should work. I should be able to change it without horrible cost. Hmm. Well, there's, I guess we'll look ahead now. I mean, there's, there's AI. AI has been around for, I don't know, quite a bit. <laughs> now there's generative AI, right? Oh, yeah. GPT released yeah. their latest model and, or open AI, I should say. And, um, I can't, I can't write software. But I have written some little programs that have automated some work I didn't really enjoy doing at my office. If I were to show you this, I don't know if you'd call it really bad. Probably really bad. I have no idea. I have no way of assessing. I just know that when I hit the little button, it does the thing I want it to do. And that's 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 great for me. That's good. But I have some concerns. <laughs> But, um, you know, one of them is, you know, I, I wonder about as this, as this technology, you know, people are going to grow up with this technology and they'll find amazing ways to use it, but inclu including developing software, I presume. And um, we were talking to uh, a software executive. And he said a problem that they're facing is junior engineers are using AI to create code, but they don't they don't have the experience to understand whether or not the code it's generated is any good or not. But yeah. it's doing what they want it to do. And so I'm wondering if this extremely powerful tool may lead to the unintended consequence of instead of enhancing performance, de degrading performance, and making us incapable of under understanding that performance is bad. What, what is your take on what, what is happening out there with this stuff? I mean, I wonder about, are we just going to become too reliant on the machine and, and become, I guess, dumber, but not understand we're getting dumber, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, you um. The generative AI application, first of all, they're miracles. They're they're masterpieces. These guys incredible, have done really, really good work. And it's and uh, the 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 um, the applications can be very, very surprising. But in the end, they are just tools. They are power tools, and it's going to take us a while to figure out how to use those power tools well. Yes, junior programmers will overestimate them. That will happen. <laughs> everybody's going in fact right now we're in the overestimating phase of what these tools can do because they have they have been so impressive that we think they are actually better than they are um once you dig in a little bit and push on them you find the where the weaknesses are and how much you can trust and how much you should not trust and we will go through a period of years working that out and we'll figure out how to use these tools as appropriate power tools uh, they will help there there's no doubt that they will help uh they'll help programmers they'll help everybody right? if you were running a company and uh you were to say okay guys you can use these tools but here's how we should use them um uh, if we were going to be using AI, generative AI tools to help write software, I would also want a, a discipline of review. Uh, and that review would have to involve more senior people. Now, there's a couple of ways to do this reviewing idea. You can do it after the fact. You can, you can have a programmer produce a bunch of code, maybe with an AI, and then you have that code uh, reviewed by... Uh, uh, someone a little older <laughs> who can go through it and say, okay, this is good, this is bad. Another way of doing this is uh, a technique that, that some of us have called pair programming or mob programming, where you have two or more people 
working on the same task at the same time at the same workstation. And one of them will say, well, let's get the AI to generate this little bit. And another one is saying, okay, I like what the AI did, except for that part there. Let's fiddle with that a little bit. And you get a, a much better integration of the skills of the people with the help of the tool. Any of those would work pretty well, I think. Uh, I prefer the the immediate mobbing pairing kind of thing as opposed to the after the fact review. But in some cases, the after the fact review, review is the only practical way to proceed. Well, besides generative AI, is there anything else out there that is exciting you in in software? Anything else that's exciting? It's almost the opposite. Um, okay. Almost the opposite. We, I grew up with Moore's law raging. Uh, we were we were doubling the speed of the computer. We were doubling the memory size of the computer once a year, once a year, every year and a half. I, we were just growing these machines uh, to an enormous degree. So I, the machines I started out with uh, are, are are a bare shadow of the machines we have today. The capabilities that we had back then are minuscule compared to what we can do today. And there are that. Those adjectives are insufficient to describe the difference. And the difference is just unbelievably enormous. Um, but that stopped. That stopped around 2003, 2004. The speed of the computer stopped getting faster. Density has been getting better, but it's getting better at a slower and slower rate. And we are approaching the atomic the atomic uh, um, deadline or the atomic limit. Uh, and so Moore's Law has, for all intents and purposes, ended. The machines, the hardware is not getting better, or at least it's not getting better at an exponential rate. Now, now if it's getting better, it's getting better a little incrementally. The laptop I have in front of me now is running at the same clock rate as the one I had 20 years ago. So that stopped. And there's this really interesting cultural momentum of Moore's Law that is still in effect. We expect everything to be getting better and better and better and better, but the hardware is not supporting that. So there's this kind of weird frustration going on about, well, maybe we could put it in the cloud. Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do microservices. Maybe we can do all these things. There's this hunt for the next big thing and the next big thing isn't coming. <laughs> well, okay, AI, AI came. There's AI, but isn't also there new platforms? I mean, it looks ridiculous now, but there's this Apple Vision Pro thing. Surely oh, yeah. that will change shape over time. And you know, I I saw a demo at a university lab just through Zoom. I didn't get to experience it in person. I hope to do that one day. But um, you know, it it made me think that we're are we that far from turning reality, 3D physical space, into just a projector screen for software? <laughs> so isn't that exciting? Um, so VR stuff, the goggles, the VR well, goggles. Well, VR, I don't, I'm not sold on VR because that's way. I mean, you can't, okay. you can't navigate the real world in, in VR. But AR, when I saw these demos, I, I, I started seeing the world differently because okay. you you can see it, it, it almost turns... It could turn physical space into a form of software. It's a platform sure. port. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. If you can get the hardware to just sit on your face comfortably and you develop a display that you can comfortably view without going insane, frying your brain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those are very powerful tools, right? Yeah. I, the, the VR goggles, the AR goggles, the Apple Vision stuff, all of that is very powerful tools. Um, I'm not saying that there's no advancement in hardware. Okay. What I'm saying is that Moore's Law stopped. And the advancements we're seeing now are incremental, not exponential. Okay. Had they continued exponentially um, from 2000 until now, I think we would all be in virtual suits. Suits, yeah. We'd be in as the opposed, matrix by now. As, yeah, as opposed yeah. to where we are currently. The, the goal of augmented reality is pretty old at this point. 
Mm. Now, is it exciting? Sure, it's exciting. It's interesting. Is it going to be the revolution that we experienced 30 and 40 years ago? And mm. I don't think it is. Mm. I, I think what's happening in the world of software is that we've we've hit this interesting kind of plateau. The hardware is at a plateau. It might have a slight upward slope, but it's not like it used to be. We're no longer roaring up into the sky. So we're, we're on this interesting plateau, and we're all trying to come to terms with what that means and how we can deal with a technology that is no longer growing exponentially. A good uh, a good comparison there is a aviation. You take a look at uh, the Wright brothers 120 years ago, right? <laughs> little things made out of wood and fabric, and within 20 years, those were metal machines screaming through the sky, dropping bombs, and within another 20 years, we were all getting onto aluminum jets and flying over across the ocean for a few hundred dollars. That was an exponential increase of enormous potential. But then that plateaued, right? The 747 invented in the 1960s, that still looks like a railroad airplane up there. Okay, you know, there's some better airplanes. 767's better, 757's better. There's some better airplanes, but they're not exponentially better. They are still essentially the same model with a few tweaks and additions and a little bit better. I think that's the, the kind of model that we are on in software. We've transitioned from that crazy exponential growth to this interesting plateau with incremental improvements. Interesting. <laughs> All right. Well, you've given me a lot. That's very interesting. Um, well, we've looked ahead. I think it's a good, I think it's probably a good place to, to wrap things up. This is a great conversation. Bob, I really appreciate you joining me here, especially tolerating. I've said this many times now, tolerating my elementary questions. So grateful for that. But uh, thanks. Thanks for joining me here on the podcast. My pleasure. I'd like to thank Bob for joining me here on the podcast. To subscribe to the Design Brief newsletter, check out the link in the show notes. And thanks to you all for listening. Until next time.